Arts Council Pro Helvetia in New Delhi and the Goethe Institute Max Müller Bhavan in Bangalore. We also have amazing partners, ThoughtWorks Arts in New York, In the Wild in Singapore, who's helping us with some production support, Supernormal also here in Singapore, uh, Dara Network, and ThoughtWorks Arts does Art Hack. And so Be Fantastic is partnering with Art Hack to deliver this uh, fellowship. So without further ado, I will invite Kritika, uh, Kartika from our team to introduce our panel of speakers for today. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would uh, like to begin with by saying that I'm very happy to have um, these wonderful panelists here addressing us today. And I'd like to uh, begin by introducing Mark Lee. Um, I believe he will not be able to attend today's session. Um, he is a Swiss artist using contemporary art as a vehicle to continuously redefine how we see ourselves and the world around us. He's experimenting with information and communication technologies and creates network-oriented interactive art projects. Um, hello, Meredith. Um, <laughs> he uh, is an artist and creative technologist based in Berlin. He studied biomedical engineering and science communication at Imperial College London. After moving to Berlin, he became interested in the creative uses of technology. His work now focuses on intersections between artistic tradition and practice and new technology. Hi. Hello, Andrew. I'm sure some of you might have already heard from Andrew McWilliams. Um, Introducing Andrew McWilliams is a new New York based artist and technologist, founder and director of ThoughtWorks Arts and a founding member of climateaction.tech. His art projects explore links between climate change, perception and society. While his advocacy is centered on support and incubation for climate action in the tech industry. Hello, Andy. And I would like to introduce you to Trishla Terreira, our moderator for the session. Um, she is the founder of Tifa Working Studios, a multidisciplinary platform for creativity and culture in India. She has developed a space to support creative innovation and critical practices through international residencies and mentorship programs. And in the last five years, Tifa has grown to be a dynamic contemporary culture center in South Asia. Welcome Trishla and over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Kartika and all the team at Be Fantastic. Jean? Uh, did sorry, did we introduce Jean? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Yes, please do. Yes. Jean. Um, hello, Jean. Um, Jean is an artist and programmer currently advising at Runway ML and teaching at New, uh, NYU. He is interested in autonomous systems, collective intelligence, generative art, and computer science. He codes, gives talks, teaches workshops, writes essays, and occasionally curates as well. Um, Jean's work is free and open source um, as he's interested in advancing scientific literacy through creativity and play and building educational spaces which are as open and accessible as possible. Hello, Jean. It's over Quickly to you, to just jump in, uh, Trishla, just one second, just to give everybody okay. a sense of how the, the, uh, the session might pan out. Um, we will have two of our speakers, Trishula talking first about her practice and the Antifa studios. And then we will have two of our speakers talking after that. We'll break with a 25 minute discussion space. And then we'll have two more speakers uh, going on thereafter. And then you'll have a discussion space at the end of that as well. So just wanted to quickly give you a sense of that. Should I start coming? Okay, super. Hi everyone, lovely to see so many familiar faces and so many new ones as well. And I'm sure we'll hear more from you and we hope for this session to be super interactive. Um, hello to obviously all of our speakers for today. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly introduce myself and show you a little bit about the work that I do. Uh, my name is Trishla Telera. We run a space in Pune, India called Tifa Working Studios. 
Tifa was born um, as an alternative educational space when we first started in 2013, uh, but slowly evolved into a residency and then into more of a larger cultural center or cultural platform. Um, today, we host a very wide range of activities from um, all kinds of events, uh, but also some digital uh, programming. Um, I will just share my screen at this point. Um, okay, are you able to see my screen? Okay, super. So um, as I said, TIFA is a multidisciplinary platform for creativity and culture. I think in the Indian context, we sometimes struggle with the word art because it was always led into, is this drawing and painting? We kind of don't do very much of that or don't do that in its pure self. So we call ourselves the Center for Creativity. Um, we're housed in 1940s Art Deco Hotel, uh, former hotel. So it's a very unique site as a space as well. It has about 16 interconnected studios to so each hotel room essentially became a studio for different artists and all the studios are different size so we they get to stay there create work uh this is an example of a music residency that we had uh with reproduce um so photographer nishan shukla who had collaborated with us uh we've done some site-specific uh, public artworks across the city this is one example uh, of that, this is the work by Vishal Dar. It's actually a video, but I don't think the audio is going to play for me, so I'm going to skip that. But it was a temporary work that was installed for about four days. Um, one of the projects that we focus on, or one of the curatorials that we focus on at TIFA is um, gender and sexuality. So we have uh, two festivals within that range. One is Women in Transnational Cinema. And the other one is the Futures of Intimacy. This is a screenshot from uh, one of the earlier ones. We found a lot of old um, furniture, a lot of old electronics on site. These are these old uh, bubble TVs uh, that we like to call them from, from the early 80s. So a lot of artists tend to use these old, old electronics, but with new media in a sense. Um, we do a lot of music, a lot of sound art, sonic art, uh, different formats of that. Um, this is our lovely Freeman. I think many of you in the room might know him here. This is a project by Polish Anoki Shah, who is also leading the new media curatorial at TIFA. We have a festival that is called the Siberia Festival that focuses on the idea of play uh, using new technologies. So this was one of the testings that we had done before the festival. Um, it was a VR project that was showcased. Um, this is a project and also a residency exchange that we have with Taiwan at Bamboo Curtain Studio. This is a project that was built by Mazudas uh, during that cultural exchange. Just to focus a little bit on Siberia, the first edition was in uh, 2019, and we had 30 artists uh, showing work in Pune, in, 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 in the person, in the flesh, and that was a really exciting time. Um, this was a project that was in collaboration with Rishi Raj Kulkarni, who's a musician, um, electronic and acoustic musician, along with Sai, um, who did the projection mapping on the, on the back facade of our building as a performance piece. In terms of Siberia, we have the second edition of Siberia, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do the 2020 edition, but we have uh, the 2021 edition, which is focused on gaming. Um, and the different aspects of video games. So learnings from it, cultural understanding of video games, building new video games. It's a two-day conference with speakers from all across the world. So I hope I would see some of you there. Um, we've also started a recent podcast around um, AI and creativity and, and all things new media and, and multiple sections that we're looking at within the new curatorial of uh, video games. Um, but I'm going to stop here in terms of my practice. If anyone has any specific questions for me, I'm happy to share my details later and we can take it offline. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is move on to a video by Mark Lee since he's not present. Kartika, I think that's over Could to you. Could you please share screen?
Oh, okay. So uh, I'm very happy to, to give this uh, uh, online presentation. Uh, I like to share three works. Uh, one is addressing biodiversity, the other one kind of also diversity. And uh, the third one, it uh, can be accustomed to the topic of climate change. In general, I do uh, works which are interactive and always change. And uh, that is uh, something which uh, yeah, I follow since a long time, because usually art is not changing. Art is kind of static. So when you go into paintings or photography or video, it's an art form which try to capture a moment and then it stays as it is. And our life, you know, we are biological uh, uh, humans or all world around us is, is made of, of biology, of, of, uh, yeah, of microorganism. And this always change. Every second, everything is changing. And so this is, uh, yeah, this is, I also address this. And this is how my, my uh, project work. They constantly change. They never stay the same. Uh, very often I use uh, social media for the projects. And the first one I like to uh, share with you is called Used to be my home too. And this work is uh, using three social networks. It using uh, Google Earth, uh, and it uses iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a social network where people can share observations. And the third uh, network I use, it's called Redlist. Manon, Red could List you please a, um, a, a very, stop sharing? Let's try this again. Uh, which, okay. uh, yeah, which... yeah, we can only hear the audio and the video is not working. Okay. Stop sharing it. Or... Sorry about that, everybody. Hi, while we saw this uh, technical issue, we have a poll for you in the meantime as launch it. Uh, Trishla, should we just move on to the folks present here? Yeah, I think that might be a good idea. And maybe we can take Mark's as the last session. Last or we can one, we'll uh, see, also yeah. possibly share the link, I think, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Do we have Meredith next? Yes. Okay. Meredith, would it be okay if you went now? Uh, yeah, let's try it. Perfect, thank you. Sorry about this, everybody. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Uh, that's my notes. That's not the right screen. Wait, hang on. Uh, 
I haven't actually presented on Zoom before. Everyone can see a presentation, right? Uh, okay, well, hello. Uh, my name is Meredith Thomas. Uh, I'm a creative technologist and artist uh, living and working in Berlin, although I am currently calling from my mum's house in London, uh, having finally, finally had a chance to see her after about a year and a half. Um, yeah, and I thought I would just kind of talk you through uh, just a few works I've been involved in. Uh, I have a bit of a climate change hot take at the end, just as a provocation. Um, and uh, yeah, so to give you an idea of what my background uh, is, um, particularly for uh, some of you who I might be mentoring later on, uh, so you can have an idea about whether I might be able to help you uh, with your proposed projects. Um, so my background is in biomedical engineering, which I studied first. Um, I always kind of had these two interests, I think, uh, in art and also in science and engineering. I struggled for a very long time to find a way to get them to fit together. Um, and so while I really enjoyed uh, studying biomedical engineering, it's an incredible um, subject to study if you ever get the chance, involving as it does aspects of electrical engineering, computer science, um, medicine, um, everything kind of mixed in together in this very um, sort of collegiate um, interdisciplinary setting. Um, but I still felt I was missing a bit of creative outlets. Um, so after that, I went on to study science communication, um, which is a bit more of a, it's kind of has a quite a strong history in the UK, actually, interestingly, probably because of, um, because we are the, uh, the ground zero of the modern anti-vaxxer movement um, with the MMR vaccine controversy back about 20 years ago now. Uh, there was a really big drive to um, uh, kind of increase the standard of science reporting in the UK to make sure that these uh, incidents didn't happen again. Um, and I think really interestingly with the attitudes to vaccines in the UK at the moment, you can kind of see that bore some fruit. Um, and so my first job that I actually took after leaving university um, was for an organization called Smart Villages which I haven't really talked about or thought about for a while because it seems like it's from a past life. Um, but I think it's quite relevant to the subject of this program. Um, so Smart Villages was uh, a small NGO based out of Cambridge, um, formed largely of sort of academics really, who wanted to do policy and advisory work and raise the profile of uh, off-grid energy access, uh, mostly in the developing world. Um, and the name Smart Villages was kind of meant as a count counterbalance to uh, a phrase which is much more common that you hear a lot nowadays, smart cities. Um, a huge amount of the world still doesn't have access to energy. I think uh, it's still one and a half, maybe two billion people worldwide um, who don't have electricity access, um, which is something that, I mean, by definition, I think everybody watching this, uh, watching this presentation takes for granted. Um, because you are watching it on an electronic device. Um, and it is kind of horrifying to think that there are so many people in the world, even as we talk about reducing our energy emissions ourselves, um, who still have no access to electronic devices at all. Um, and so most of the policy work that we did was kind of, um, yeah, it was kind of looking at ways, mostly these kind of uh, small kind of solar microgrids um, um, and kind of looking at best practice there. Um, so yeah, we traveled around the world a lot. Um, we did a lot of kind of, uh, a lot of meetings. We spent an awful lot of money on flights and hotels um, and publishing policy documents, which small numbers of people would probably have read. Um, and yeah, I don't know, these are some photos. This was in, uh, this was a small hydroelectric project uh, in Borneo. Uh, which we went to visit, and this would be like really typical of of um, of the kind of thing we would do, where we would take kind of large international groups, uh, trying to kind of bring together local policymakers, local NGOs with INGOs, um, also trying to kind of cross fertilize expertise between regions. Um, so, uh, for example, we kind of did a lot of trying to 
sort of mixed community or like get community leaders from Southeast Asia, meeting up with community leaders from um, Sub-Saharan Africa and community leaders from uh, sort of South America to kind of see whether they could um, share knowledge on how to deal with some of these problems. Um, so yeah, we would take long sort of trails of, of experts um, sort of upriver. In this case, it was a two day trip to, to reach this very isolated uh, longhouse. Um, so yeah, I, I worked basically as a communications officer there. And um, I was trying to think before this presentation what my kind of conclusions on this whole experience was, because in the end, I left a little disillusioned, I think, mainly because even in the time I was working there, um, I started to notice like quite how, particularly for the provision of these very low level services and this kind of these first steps on the economic ladder, like how ineffective governments and NGOs were at making change there and how wildly effective actually the private sector was whenever there were success stories. Um, you know, in all the time that we were trying to promote off-grid energy in, in Uganda, say, um, the absolute biggest changes to people's lives in that region came from mobile phone companies um, coming in and providing mobile phone services, um, where there was absolutely no funding at all provided by INGOs. Um, and it was all kind of private sector investment. So I kind of, yeah, I don't, after a while, I kind of found this a bit, um, uh, it wasn't quite, it wasn't quite me. And I left, moved to Berlin um, and um, started a career in creative technology. Um, this is the sort of kind of stuff I've done over the last couple of years. Um, I spent uh, some time working for a, um, working for a design studio called Watts Bonaire. Uh, where we were experimenting with, um, where we were experimenting with uh, some of the new generative adversarial networks, uh, making these very shiny visuals. This is one of my very, it was one of my favorite projects we did here. Um, this is using um, sort of uh, what three D three D data of uh, performers dancing um, uh, to train an unsupervised model. Um, and then sort of as we navigate through the latent spaces, we start to get these very interesting organic dance-like poses, even though the model had no sense of time. Um, it did have obviously like within its internal representation, it's, it's placed poses uh, next to each other, which are close together in space. Um, so we were able to get these very kind of eerie, beautiful animations out of them. Um, the sort of flagship projects I'd say we did while I was there was Helen, uh, which uh, won the Lumen Prize, um, where we uh, trained another generative adversarial network um, on a large data set of um, sculpture, much of it from antiquity. Um, spent a very long time uh, uh, not only training this model, but then kind of choosing parts within the latent space of this model that we found interesting. Um, um, and then finally went all the way to actually kind of taking this thing from the from the from the virtual space from the from the imagined space of the model uh, and machining it in real marble again. So I will skip to the end. Um, so yeah, um, really kind of going all the way, doing something that you do quite rarely in digital art, which is coming all the way back to the kind of, uh, to the origins of sculpture um, and making something permanent in the world um, that's hard to ignore, um, but pretty much on the principle that people had to accept it as art uh, if it was literally impossible to destroy and almost by definition would uh, last until the end of time. Um, Uh, some of my own sort of solo work, um, sort of again uses machine learning. Um, this is a project I worked on a couple of years ago and have still yet to really publish. Um, but this was using uh, the uh, ability of neural networks to um, sort of measure perceptual differences between images. So in other words, um, have a measure of similarity that is much more sophisticated and in theory at least based on um, some kind of semantic knowledge of the content of the image, um, which would be different from any kind of more statistical uh, measure you could have. 
of, of how similar images are. And this allows you to create these kind of quite interesting collage works where the algorithm is selecting um, sort of, I call them patches to, um, to reproduce an underlying image, but the choices it's make, it makes starts to get very interesting. Um, so these are some more examples. I really should publish some of this. Um, and in more use, recent years, I would say the last year, year and a half, um, most of my um, most of my work has actually been in theatre in Germany. Um, so I've worked on there was a I think there was a bit of a craze for AI in theatre. So I worked on three or four productions over the last year or two. Um, this is the most recent, um, and I think the one I'm most proud of um, called Antifa AI which actually involves quite a relatively small amount of artificial intelligence, but otherwise I think is a really fascinating um, production. Not too much documentation yet, unfortunately, but I will show you the, I will show you the teaser. Um, so this was done with Cobra Theatre Collective, who are a German theatre collective based in Hamburg. Um, and it's quite a political piece. So it was really about the, um, um, about the kind of history and practice of anti-fascist action in Germany. Um, so it was an interactive theater installation, which due to the pandemic, we had to find a way to show remotely. Um, so the entire project was kind of experienced by the audience through Zoom calls, um, which was a bit of a shame, right? Because a lot of this project was, uh, was kind of programs we'd written to make people directly engage with uh, fascist and racist content um, in telegram groups, mostly private telegram groups. So we'd written a whole series of kind of uh, bots to kind of uh, to kind of uh, troll these groups. Um, and we wanted the audience to really directly engage with the content, not only that, but also kind of measure certain properties of the content, how hateful it was, how much of a call to action it was. Um, in order to kind of train some kind of, at that point, fictitious AI in order to do the work of, of anti-fascist activism. Um, so we had to find, this would be an example, for example, uh, this would be an example, uh, I think this plot here shows a graphic that we produced uh, through the performance where we would get people to look at Twitter trends in their local area, get people to identify, um, fascists active on Twitter talking about those trends um, and then get the audience to agree on whether they categorize somebody as a fascist or not, at which point we would put them into this kind of network map um, of, of um, German racists. And so in that way, we were really trying to draw the audience in. Um, but that was only a part of this piece. We also had live music. Uh, we also had uh, sort of live installations. Um, and in the end, we managed to kind of simulate a lot of the interactivity through the um, interface of Jitsi itself. So linking up some of these interactive programs such that the audience could sort of interact remotely um, in a similar way to how they would have if they had actually been in the space. Um, so this we're still showing. It's going to show in Stuttgart, uh, I think, in October and hopefully a couple of other places in Germany. And hopefully at some point we will be able to show it with a live audience. These are, these are data visualizations uh, we took from some open source databases of uh, racist attacks in Germany uh, on the large map. And again, we were asking people to um, submit their own stories. So the longer the performance goes on, the more we tour it, so the kind of the richer the, the, the data set we collect becomes. Um, and the, the better trained are uh, Antifa AI. Almost at the end of time, Lady. Okay, I will I will hurry up then. So yeah, that's um, yeah. So that's uh, it's just a few pieces I wanted to talk about. I also wanted to give a bit of a provocation and, and a hot take on the subject of the climate emergency. Um, it's a bit of a meme now, but this kind of uh, there's a, there's a term in Germany that we talk about called ecofascism, um, where actually the ecological movement and the far right can be quite connected in some way. Um, and you hear this kind of "we are the virus" phrase banded around a lot. It's a bit of a meme at this point. Um, 
but I actually think it's a little despicable and it really fails to understand a to respect human life I think which is should always be a core value um, but also just like fails to understand humanity and our place in nature um, so I don't know if anyone, I'm a bit also a bit of an archaeology and ancient history nut. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes these. Um, this is called a desert kite. Um, and they're found in the kind of mostly in the Black Desert, which is a region kind of in Syria and Jordan. They were first noticed by RAF pilots during the First World War, flying supply runs between Cairo and Baghdad. Um, and they're actually quite under-researched, but they, they cover the whole desert in this region. Um, they're human constructions. They've been dated to maybe three, 4,000 years BC. So that's a very long time ago. Um, these people probably didn't have writing. They probably didn't have metalworking. Um, but these constructions are kilometers in length um, and stretch hundreds of miles north and south. Um, and what they're designed to do is to channel migrating gazelle into killing pits. Um, and I find these incredible, right? Prehistoric Bronze Age, possibly earlier man, has already completely changed the landscape uh, of their region to, to mechanize the slaughter of animals. Um, and that shouldn't really surprise us because the mass extinction we're currently causing um, is not even our first mass extinction, right? We uh, humans back in prehistory, uh, even a little earlier than this period, maybe uh, 10,000 BC, already caused the extinction of megafauna in North America, uh, the mammoths worldwide. Um, so this kind of this already isn't our first time, right? We, we've we've already massively changed the landscape of our planet unrecognizably and caused extinctions before we were long before we even had a chance of being aware that we were doing it. Because I had to fit dogs into this presentation, I would also mention that um, I would also mention that we had some help doing this, right? Like we're not we're not guiltless on our own. We also trained these animals to help us, and we probably wouldn't have caused these extinctions um, without dogs. Um, and then also this kind of slightly fatalistic idea that, you know, even if we screw up, um, even if we sort of screw this up uh, and climate change does, uh, the climate emergency does reach its kind of most feared peaks, there's a kind of sense that humanity will die as a result of this uh, and then some kind of natural order will be restored. And I'm sorry to break it to you, but humans are not going to die off um, that like we're even even a nuclear war in its worst manifestations, it's a bit of a myth that that would ever have caused the extinction of humanity. Um, there will always be some survivors. We're so technically adept, we're so resourceful, and within three or four generations, uh, we could bounce back. Um, there are even plans out there um, for surviving the heat death of the universe. Um, there are workable plans for harvesting energy from black holes after all the stars have disappeared that would enable human civilization to continue. That is how resourceful we are. And I feel that as not so much a techno optimist, but a techno realist, um, we have to sort of own our power and own our responsibilities. We've already changed this world. We have a huge amount of power to change it for better or worse. And we kind of need to start accepting that power and, and start making some really grown up choices about how we want our planet to continue, like how we want to relate with, uh, with nature, um, bearing in mind that there is no natural state to return to. That's my hot take. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mario. That was fantastic. I think there's so many projects there that everyone is just like, we need to know more about these. Um, but I think it was a great overview and I think we'll have a lot of questions. Um, the way that we formatted this, that is we'll have you and then Jean go right after you and then we'll take a joint discussion so that both of you can answer. Um, so Jean, I'm gonna hand this over to you for your presentation. Okay. Hi everybody. Um... Let me just kind of get sorted out here. Okay, super. Uh, uh, if anyone has any questions for Meredith in the meantime, you can put it in the chat so we can make note of them in, in case you don't want to forget them. Can uh, can everybody hear me? 
Yes, well, June. Okay, great. Um, so I'll put up some some slides here. Oh, let me share my screen. Okay, you guys see my screen? Um, so I'll I'll basically describe. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes just describing my kind of general work, and then I'm going to tell you about two projects um, that I'm I'm focused on right now. Um, so I'm I'm an artist and a programmer. I've been um, mo most of my work um, is is based around machine learning. I've been doing this for for a little while. I make a lot of um, generative generative art with it. Um, for for a couple of years now, I've maintained like a workshop practice. So I do a lot of teaching. It used to look like this before we had a pandemic to worry about. Um, hopefully in the future, it'll get back to things like this. Um, I, I make a lot of uh, educational materials for people to learn about how to how to do machine learning for, you know, sort of creative for creative applications. Um, and I compile them. Actually, this link is out of date. <laughs> so it's old slides. Um, this the link is, should actually be ml4a.net. So uh, ml4a stands for Machine Learning for Artists, and and I have a new website for it, ml4a.net, and it's basically a whole bunch of sort of um, I guess I should just maybe even show it. It's a bunch of materials to um, make it easy to kind of get started with with AI. I'll show you some of the materials. So if you go to ml4a.net, you'll see. It's just a lot of like mostly online notebooks for um, just educating people how to how to with a, just a little bit of code how to how to make all of the cool stuff you see with GANs and style transfer and all of that and so on. Um, and there's also some book chapters and um, other stuff available. I'm I'm also um, been a big user of Open Frameworks for a long time, and that's also there's a bunch of applications in those. And I also record a lot of my classes and I put them online. They don't actually go as fast as it looks here. Um, but if you go to ml4a.net, um, you'll see a link for classes. Um, and and um, yeah, you can, you can watch those if you're interested in sort of 20 hours of, of this. Um, so I make a lot of generative art um, using things like Deep Dream. So uh, these are methods for making neural networks make interesting kinds of art. Um, this is a technique that basically synthesizes textures um, from a um, some kind of a source texture. So this is like Hokusai um, and so on, Kandinsky, um, and um, these are actually perfect loops. So they're going. These are actually they're just three seconds long, and so they're just kind of you know turning into themselves. Um, this is Google Maps. This is my favorite one. I just always kind of like, like to show this. So um, I do a lot of work with style transfer, which is you know regenerating one image like the Mona Lisa in the style of another image, like Starry Night, uh, Hokusai, uh, Google Maps, and so on. Um, and then also I've been working with uh, GANs as as um, as Meredith introduced GANs. I've been using these for for a long time, um, making interesting kinds of uh, visuals and so on. Um, I make a lot of installations. So the, this is a sort of style transfer mirror that I've had uh, installed in a whole bunch of places. Um, in, uh, so it, it basically just shows you in the style of whatever source image that you that you would like. And um, so I've had some you know fun making this. Another installation here, which basically lets you make photorealistic paintings with your just by touching your fingers. Um, to the so here this person is drawing actually that's just me this is a tutorial video it's me drawing um, uh, mountains and rocks and grasses and you know ocean and so on um, again mostly just for for the sake of fun and this is um, moving around these little pieces to uh, plastic pieces to represent buildings parks and water and um, you know, kind of see what that looks like. This is installed in Berlin. So if anybody's ever out in Berlin, Germany, uh, you can go check this out at, at a museum called Futurium. Do a lot of stuff with faces. Um, so I've been kind of interested in this whole deep fake 
thing. It wasn't called DeepPake at the time, but but making DeepPakes for um, for a number of years. So now these have become sort of photorealistic, um, and um, I like to think that my my job, you know, as a as an artist working with emerging technology, is to kind of warn people about the future, in a certain sense. Um, uh, as I said, it's all photorealistic now. This is actually work from NVIDIA um, from just from already three years ago. So at this point, um, if you've ever seen like this person does not exist, you know that these kinds of uh, works are becoming basically indistinguishable from reality. Um, so this is a little joke I made with FaceApp, um, running it through the face, running it through the smiling filter over and over and over until basically it stopped recognizing my face. Um, and more recently, I've been really engaged with the new work that allows you to make images from text. So basically, you create an input. And actually, I'll just show you this real quick. I'm working on a project called Abraham. And I'll, I'll maybe describe this in a little bit. So let, let, we can make images from text. So um, I'm going to make an image out of the first text that somebody um, cares to share. Um, somebody call out a random string of text descriptive. Um, anybody want to volunteer? Be fantastic yeah. together. Be fantastic together. Be fantastic together. Okay. Oh, and I <clears throat> take to tokens. You have to get those tokens from me right now. Um, but uh, yeah, let's grab a token. Okay, so we'll come back in a couple of minutes and it should be done. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll just show you like, so this stuff you can, so this is like, for example, the cosmos is full of cheeseburgers. So um, here's the cosmos is full of cheeseburgers. Basically, neural networks are now capable of generating images from text inputs and um, really pretty compelling ones. So of pretty much anything you can imagine. So I've been pretty um, engrossed in this lately. It's all new stuff from this year. A Gothic castle under moonlight, a field full of corn stalks and lots of corn growing on the field. Um, Rothko princess, this is all random sea prompts. A whole bunch of strange sea creatures under the ocean. Um, and so you can kind of see what that, what that looks like. Basically, um, uh, well, while this is kind of finishing up, I'll, I'll mention really quickly a project called Abraham, um, which, uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? It's like I'm not tracking, uh, like halfway. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So um, I'll, I'll quickly show you Abraham. Um, uh, more, this is a project to, um, to create what I've been calling for a couple of years, an autonomous artificial artist. And it's basically, um, I'm interested in making some kind of a generative art program that sort of exhibits its own, um, its own, uh, I don't know how to say it, you know, sort of personality, uh, its own originality, kind of uniqueness, and make original works of art, kind of using a combination of, of AI, obviously, but, but also um, uh, like human collaboration, like if you can try to get people to to um you know to create a sort of hive mind that can um curate and um you know and co-create essentially to make works of art that are much bigger than any in any one of them as individuals um so I'm, I'm kind of interested in this collective creativity sort of collective imagination you might say and um, Abraham has been this project to try to to try to figure out how to do that um, that I've been thinking about for for a few years, and I've I've only actually recently started developing this. This this this, this demo here is just actually um, like one month old, and so it's a really new project. Um, but basically, the the idea is to try to create a um, a system where people curate together and um you know generate these interesting works of art so be fantastic the other is is going to be one of them as you can see um, i'm working on a completely new interface for this um that um should be out this week um and uh and so yeah it's just something i i usually 
if I talk about this, I, I, I usually need a lot more time. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of let it, let it be. Um, that, but there's, um, if you go to the front page, you'll see I wrote an, a couple articles about it. Um, if you click on autonomous artificial artist down here, you can read the initial article I wrote um, describing kind of the, the goal of this project. And I, I, I did have some extra slides um, that we can look at really quickly while we wait. Um, yeah, there's this whole, the persona is based on the, of course, the character of Abraham in the Bible. There's a reasoning behind that, but I, I don't really have the time to get into it. So I'd, I'd like to, so I can punt that to the article. Um, I've been, you know, really interested in AI arts for a long time. So it's kind of combining that with this idea of an art DAO. And so a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's kind of a term that's become pretty popular this year to describe um, basically crypto-based social networks that are uh, decentralized and collaborating over some shared goals. And so the art DAO idea is actually goes back to, to making a, a DAO that creates art uh, that goes back a couple of years. And I talk about different art DAO limitations and so on. The idea of making generative art collaboratively um, together um, and curating it. More recently, I've been interested in, in sort of mechanics for cu curation. Uh, because the thing about AI art is that it generates infinite amounts of artwork. You know, it's like, um, you know, so then the, the question is, how do we find the good ones? Um, you know, the scarcity is no longer the labor of the artist, but it's the attention of the, of the you know, the person looking at art. It's like, there's, there's too much art in the world that these things can generate. So how do we find the, the good ones? Um, and so it's inspired by certain aspects of nature. So emergence in, um, you know, super organisms, um, you know, kind of, and we do have this cultural, um, you know, this concept of a hive mind, which is a singular mind or life or entity that is uh, somehow more, um, well, is kind of salient above the, above the individuals that make it up. Um, dunes are another example of emergence. Um, emergence is a really important property in generative art. So here, you know, you see dunes, but really there's only sort of grains of sand. Um, so there's really actually a whole lot to this. It's also a very technical project because I'm interested in decentralizing machine learning, which is something that's really, really, really difficult and challenging and kind of futuristic and um, doesn't, doesn't really exist, but probably will um, for various reasons. There's a lot of things that you could, that you could do with machine learning when, um, including, for example, respecting people's privacy and um, a lot of security applications, which are really important um, when, when you can make machine learning not centralized, uh, not have to collect data about people, not have to, um, well, uh, there's a whole, whole lot of things that we can sort of get into. And then this project is um, sort of, it's, um, it's at the confluence of a whole bunch of fields that I'm interested in, um, in those the four of them are kind of like computer art, philosophy of mind, um, and um, kind of decentralization, blockchain, crypto, technology tokens, and all that, and AI. And so this is just uh, sort of what's been on my mind. And it's and I don't consider it a new idea. There's a lot of there's been you know over time there's been many artists who have talked about you know making an AI that sort of um, oh well I'm not actually at the end sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm going to describe one more project um, besides for Abraham, but if you're interested in Abraham, that AI um, in, uh, oh, let me just see if I, if uh, that finished, where is it? Oh, I think I even closed it. So let's just really quickly go back to the creations. Um, oh, here it is. It's done. Okay. It didn't, didn't it, this one didn't work out so well um be fantastic together so th the whole thing the thing is that it, it sort of works well it, it's most impressive when you use a text prompt that's very descriptive so water lily impressionist watercolor so you know that that's what that looks like this has been all made by other people um call me ishmael it was a dark and stormy night um yeah so I mean, you can look, you can look through this. It's all online. Abraham.ai slash create a castle in the sky. Um, usually Thanks things are more Jean. abstract, end up generating text. 
Um, yeah, but, yeah, thanks um, for trying. <laughs> yeah. but anyway, if anyone's interested in trying this out, uh, just email me uh, and um, and I'll or, or um, actually go on to here and join the Discord. And then on Discord, um, you'll see a link to the Discord in the front page. Um, and um, you know, and I'll I'll give you tokens to to try it out. <laughs> uh, last thing I'll talk about if I have a minute is uh, how much time do I have? Like three minutes? A minute. A minute. Okay, I'll just mention really quickly Mars College. Um, something that lots of people here, um, actually some of the people in the room know about. This is a project that um, that I've been work that I've been kind of organizing out in the desert in California for the last uh, two years, um, along with uh, Freeman, who was mentioned earlier. Um, we basically had this idea to try to bring a whole bunch of people out to the desert, um, sort of an artist residency of sorts. It's maybe not exactly an artist residency, but it's a, a community living off grid, learning how to um, kind of support each other as a community, rely, rely on, you know, have, have a sort of element of self-reliance and and um, do a lot of art and technology projects. Uh, you can see all the pictures on the on the gallery. Um, Freeman's all about building uh, with pallet racks. So he creates these large structures out of uh, conventional warehousing shelves and materials. And um, yeah, and kind of, uh, then we go out there, we set up solar power and um, we're really into the electric unicycle and there's just a whole bunch of other fun stuff. We do a lot of educational stuff. So we kind of organize workshops uh, the, the participants organize workshops. It's all sort of self-organized. And um, you know, there's a lot of yoga and we had a live coding meetup this past, uh, this past, uh, this past round. And um, so we're, we're doing it again in, um, this is a nice little aerial view. Uh, we're gonna be doing it again this um, upcoming winter. And so uh, for anyone who's interested in and can join us in California and wants to spend a couple of months kind of living in a desert with a whole bunch of other humans, um, doing art and technology projects, um, please uh, do get in touch. You can either email me or um, we'll have an application for this uh, coming out really soon. The, the page that says join has all the info about that. The application should be out in September. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was a huge rush, but um, yeah, hopefully hopefully that was uh, kind of got across all the stuff I wanted to show. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jean. I think, yeah, it was a, a really wide practice uh, to show in such a limited amount of time. But thank you. I, I think it was a good job with kind of touching upon at least triggering all the conversations. Um, I've been super excited about Mars. I'm trying to get myself there. And let's see if things open up. Um, if anyone has questions, if you could just ask them in the chat box, or if you would like to ask them in person, you could raise your hand. Um, Jean and Meredith, I'm going to do a quick discussion with the two of you. Um, so we'll just start taking some questions. Since I have some that have already come in for Meredith, I'm going to start with that. Um, Meredith, I think uh, one of the questions that came in uh, for you in the beginning was, how do you measure hate? And I think this was looking at your project, um, anti, uh, anti FA, AI. anti, yeah, sorry. Well, Antifa, I think is the American way. Antifa, um, yes, correct. Um, so in this case, we were just kind of asking our audience, right? Like, and the idea was to kind of, you know, very loosely to kind of uh, get this data set of what our audiences felt was hateful or not. Um, and it's obviously super culturally specific, right? Like one of the really odd things about this project was it was all in, uh, was it was all in German language. So I had this really weird kind of like outsider role where I was just kind of writing the code somehow and actually not that close to the text and set the cells and it was our audience we were really asking uh yeah I think this uh next question will kind of apply to Jean and Meredith both is um more, more from a I think impact perspective is that how do we employ our projects and how do we see their effect or impact in climate change this is asked by Pranshu um, so what kind of impact do, do our projects make in, in, in the real scheme of things, actually? Um, I think, so for me, the, the, the best, you know, the best way to think about climate change is to make, is, is to, well, I guess two things. One is uh, supporting development of, of uh, technology for renewable energy. Um, and the second way is, um, you know, finding ways of living such that um, you can mitigate climate change to some degree. Um, part of Mars College is, is, 
is uh, at least partially um, that. Um, so we're, you know, we're interested, we do a lot of, we live in a desert sort of off grid. And so we don't really consume much energy and it's all mostly solar power. And, um, and we sort of, you know, we think of the desert as, um, well, I don't know, maybe California is gonna look like that in some 50 or hundred years. So we're practicing a little bit for the future. Um, uh, you know, not not to be too not to be too um, crushing about it, um, but also uh, and then for the the first one, you know, making renewable energy resources. I think you know, people you know that that really want to make a difference should go into science technology to make make renewable energy, um, make renewable energy work, uh, make it make everybody want it, and um, I think art projects can can inspire people to do that. Um, but the, the real job is, I would say, you know, in the, in the science technology, um, you know, the developing, you know, ways of, ways of consuming less resources and ways of using them more efficiently. And, and also just like um, accepting to some degree that probably some climate change is basically inevitable. And so, um, you know, we'd like to be able to help people, um, well, you know, live, uh, live with some of the impending climate change. So, um, you know, so it's a mix of mitigation, um, you know, well, um, trying to prevent things before they occur and, um, and um, you know, well, those two things I would say. Super. I think Meredith in his presentation kind of uh, ended with this kind of optimistic, apocalyptic optimism um, that humans would survive. So Meredith, if you want to touch upon that. Yeah, I mean, on the subject of, like, I'm in London right now, where we've, like, uh, I don't know if you know the group Extinction Rebellion, um, but, like, they really made a splash a couple of summers ago, and they have, like, artists, that are, like, really central to their movement, and, like, as much as that, there are obviously lots of things we can do ourselves, but I think the biggest responsibility we all have is to try and hold people in power to account. You know, 70% of carbon emissions are from the top 100 country, uh, companies. There are really not that many people who are directly responsible for this. Um, and artists, because they have very little to lose normally, are in a good position to, to hold powerful people to account. And I think that's our primary job. And art is a great way to do this because, um, because it's something, holding people to account is really just pointing your finger and saying, look, look at this person look at what they're doing or look at this organization look at what they're doing um, and art is a, a, a in order to attract attention to them and art is um, and I think art is one of the main ways to do it um, uh, and then what's the other question <laughs> sorry I'm on mute um, I think the the question that came in from Saranj was quite linked to this is that uh, how do we get governments, uh, how do we leave governments to negotiating to cut down emissions when kind of they don't really care about, the billionaires don't care about the ecosystem. So I think it's really talking about the ground up approach of what artists are capable of and how do we kind of rebel against the system or kind of show the alternative of what can be the new way of leading life possibly. Uh, so I don't think it was a specific question, but it was more like a Human, human, humanitarian question of how do we all come together to do this? Um, I'm gonna jump into um, a project, uh, actually Mars, uh, Jean, if you'd like to share a little bit more in terms of uh, collaboration, because I know you talk a lot about collaboration and artists coming together using these tools. So how, what do you see as like the main hiccups of, of collaboration within this kind of technological framework that we're all operating in today? In, uh, at Mars College? And Mars College and also ideas that you think might extend outside of Mars College, which are possible yeah. too. Well, um, well, that's a really broad question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess that um, people are intrinsically different, so they they don't agree on things, and so it's it's you, you know, if you if you want things to be really collaborative, you have to find ways of of collaborating in a way that sort of best uses everybody's talents and, you know, makes everyone feel part of the process. And so for me, like the kind of, um, you know, at, at Mars, it's more informal, but, but of course, a lot of this also happens online. And so I, I've been interested in um, tools that, that make people collaborate better in a way that um, kind of respects everyone's, respects everyone's, let's say, so, I mean, it respects everyone's rights, obviously, but that, that's, that's like very general, 
but in particular, like um, with, with Abraham, for example, there's a, an element of the project that is uh, in, particularly interested in rights that that seem to be kind of neglected in the day of the in the age of the internet. So one of those rights is privacy. Um, I know it it doesn't look very much connected to to Abraham, but um, it is. I promise, if you if you read the article and see the technology stack, um, but also like the decentralization helps to um, well the idea if it's if it's functioning properly is that decentralization uh, allows you know both power and curatorial power and 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 um, you know create you know sort of creative autonomy to to distribute a little bit better. Um, this is kind of what in, excites me about sort of the idea of Web3. Web3 is kind of self-owned or, or not self-owned, user-owned um, social networks instead of platform-owned social networks where, um, you know, sort of the, the equity in the, in, the, um, in the network is um, owned by the users of the, of the platform rather than the platforms. And then, um, so th those are all things that I think help um, collaboration because they they tend to marginalize people less. Um, uh, uh, you know, ownership is a big part of it. Um, it's a really broad question, so I. I it is just sorry. Explain. Yeah, no, that's I'll, good. Yeah. I'm uh, Saranch. I think you wanted to expand on your question further, so I'm going to see if I can or if Kartika can give access for you to be able to ask your question. So unmute you. Yeah, I can unmute myself. That's okay. Okay, super. Great, thank you so much, Trishla. I think the question that I was asking was linked to what uh, Meredith signed off on, which is, uh, you know, we need to make grown-up choices. So I just wanted to ask, what are these grown-up choices? And and uh, because underlying that is the assumption of who is in the position to make that choice, because not everyone is in the position to make that choice, right? Uh, when it especially comes to the future of the planet. So, um, so that's where the billionaire question comes in. That, that's where the government's negotiating to reduce carbon emission comes in. Who will make the grown-up choice and who are we asking to grow up? Yeah, I mean, that's that's difficult, right? Like it's, in a sense, it doesn't, you know, I, like, <laughs> the traditional Marxist view of this is it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really matter if we all agree on a shared vision for how we want our planet to behave if, if the people and the institution in powers don't people people and institutions in power don't share it um so there's there's always kind of two approaches to this one you know we form these we we form these parallel societies we form these kind of proofs of concepts um you know between ourselves and we hope that it that influences the broader debates in some way and sort of moves the overton window in 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 the, in the favorable direction um which i think you know works um and the other is kind of finding ways to finding ways to take power, and that's a that's a age old question, right? Um, yeah, and as as for like how we cooperate better in general, like I mean, I think this is kind of an unsolved problem, particularly in social spaces. I think a lot of our a lot of these kind of public online spaces just just kind of happened uh, like these social media and technology companies were just sort of responding uh, without much kind of planning and we we've kind of we have a set of digital infrastructure which no one really put much thought into um, I'm sort of trying to pitch a project as sort of a performance project at the moment where we sort of try and really break apart some of these um, some of these kind of phenomena online of, of kind of filter bubbling and that sort of this this we break apart some of the the ways in which our social interactions are, are mediated by technology online and bring it into a kind of much smaller kind of workshoppy space where between participants is and audiences and performers we say you know what really happens if if we create a, an economy for attention between the audience and the performers but like within a certain space uh, or within like a physical real space, just to see what we learn from that experience. Um, yeah, and then in terms of growing up decisions, like it's, you know, how much do we do we care about pandas more than we care about, um, you know, cytoplankton, you know, like um, one is clearly much more important for our shared survival. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I mean by the growing up decisions, um, really, Really making conscious decisions about how we want our environments to look, um, what what can be saved, and what actually probably can't in the long term. Um, Thank you, Meredith. Um, I think that that beautifully sums up um, 
I think all the grown-up decisions that we all need to make here. Um, I think this, uh, unfortunately, due to the lack of time, brings us to the end of this discussion. Uh, so we're going to move on to Andy at this time. Thank you so much, Jean and Meredith. Um, if you have any questions, you can always ask them and we'll, we'll try and uh, have the chat active. Uh, but over to you, Andy. Andy is um, from ThoughtWorks. Hi. Um, so I guess I just want to begin by actually answering one of the questions that was posed to the other artists. Um, the question about what impact artists can have, because that leads into, you know, a lot of what I've been doing with my career. Um, and I think that the answer is a little broader than that. I think that Gene's right that like, for, you know, link, focusing on renewable energy technologies and, and other technological interventions is important. I think that that's a very good option. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, do, examples by projects is also a good option. But I think there's a lot more power that we have. And, you know, that's a big part of why I do what I do, which is that we have the power to intervene and change worldviews, <laughs> which is a, a huge power if you think about it. Now that doesn't happen immediately. You don't like wake up and say, I'm going to change this worldview and then tomorrow that happens. But we have the power as a community and we have the power as individuals within communities to find areas to intervene in change narratives and change perspectives. And, um, you know, so on the grand scale, on the global scale, that's really hard to do. Again, you don't wake up tomorrow and do that. But the way to think about it is who are the communities that I'm closely connected to or that I understand very well, whether that's a localized geographic community, whether that's an interest group community, whether that's um, some combination of the two. So, um, and then say to yourself, well, how are they thinking about things now? And what impact could like a project, like an intervention that I make have? And then again, straight off the bat, you might not know what that is, but through the process of sketching and observing and experimenting and exhibiting, you can develop that w alongside an audience, you know? And so, you know, I know a lot of activists and I know a lot of technologists and I know a lot of other community members who really, really want artists to get more involved in this stuff because artists have this power that they don't have. They struggle to break through the noise. They say, check out my graphs, check out my data. But artists have the power to move people emotionally. And so I just think it's important to recognize that um, artists, especially in collaboration with other community members and as, as people who can intervene culturally and narratively have a huge power um, just within the fingertips of our practice. So, you know, that kind of leads into what I've been trying to do and maybe helps to try and explain why I've done things the way I have. Um, I have a kind of a knotted vine type career I'll share my screen in a minute and show some projects, but basically, you know, I've done independent art practice, uh, program direction, community engagement, algorithmic media, software development. And in my art practice, you know, I'll show some of these projects so you get a feel for that. Um, I deal with time a lot. I think in particular about how and why we should understand urgency and draw attention to, you know, loss of time, because that's what I feel emotionally when I look at this scenario unfolding um it's what really emotionally drives me so the sense of time we've lost and time and the, p the power and the potency of the time we have remaining um so i guess a lot of the recent recent phase of my work over the last eight years started with a series of visual and audio algorithmic experiments which became artworks and from that i extracted and open sourced a number of like open frameworks plugins um, which have become quite widely used and, you know, graphical and audio and hardware device related plugins. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. There, so kind of, you know, this portion of what I've done began with like this insulin artwork, which is about personal health. Um, you know, it's, it looks at diabetes, which I was diagnosed in 2013 and it reads out real time blood glucose values from a device that's injected into my arm or into my belly and uh, it visualizes them using this kind of graphical overlay style that I developed some graphics and then I extracted these into plugins for open frameworks. Um, but these but these actually came from a, a bunch of sketches, you know, where just like we are doing and be fantastic now where I was like running through 
oh, let's try out this technique, that technique, that technique, and then just generating sketches. And then ultimately I pulled some of those together, added the hardware data and came up with this artwork. So this is kind of like an, an origin of um, what came next. skip one okay so emergency room um and what emergency room does is this is this is bringing it to climate um so it lots it shows a lot of these kind of themed video images of planetary effects like extreme weather um or of calving calving is where like huge sections of ice drop off of ice sheets into oceans um it shows lots of video of activist struggles of like demonstrations of fossil fuel infrastructure and other interventions and it shows solutions like renewable energy technology and it wraps all of that up and puts it into a, like a, a planetary health emergency framing it's like a, a room-sized installation artwork and you hear like the beeping of a hospital emergency room and you have this kind of graphical representation of like heart rate and um you know so i'm bringing these larger themes and trying to make them direct and personal and you know having having made that intervention with like the health technology community then i'm looking at how to connect that to climate and um look at look at planetary emergency as like a personal health emergency so what's driving that under the hood just technically is it's open frameworks and it's a bunch of networked coordination from media from lots of different devices lots of different screens and they're coordinating over a network and um a sound synthesis environment it's non-linear, meaning all the devices had access to these data banks of videos and the system would move through themes. So it would go through like thematic sections and each system chose based on the current theme, which sets of video to overlay against other video in the room. Um, so it's kind of an immersive kind of unguided tour through this idea of an emergency encoded environment. Um, the two degree window. So here's another example of like, by this point, I'm doing this with a, a large group of other people. Uh, one of them is M.A. Katari, who may even be on this call, who um, we, we work together with a group to produce this project. And um, what it does is it looks at like the calculated time available, you know, to hit the two degree window, which the most recent IPCC report basically pours a lot of cold water on the idea. I mean, it basically says, yes we could hit that if we rapidly transition extremely rapidly globally right now it's theoretically possible we could hit that two degree but that's that's the best case scenario and here's five others. so but like visualizing that given it's such an important set of numbers like two degrees 1.5 um and and the timeline within which we have space for action to actually prevent that outcome Visualizing that seemed incredibly important. So we as a group uh, put this project together that visualizes it over like famous elements of cities. Um, and again, that's using open frameworks and some graphical plugins uh, to what, what became graphical plugins for open frameworks to digitally overlay these clocks. Um, so skipping forward, I mean, those are those are some of the like the artwork interventions, but at the same time, I'm like trying to showcase what I'm doing and um, figure out how to connect that to community. So, you know, I guess that's my whole thing of like how this evolved is that I've become involved in like instigating and developing and supporting uh, like a number of global communities. This TEDx in 2017 was where I like sort of connect my personal practice uh, into the what became ThoughtWorks Arts. Um, which was a funded residency program. Um, hang on, I'll just skip that. Uh, but what became ThoughtWorks Arts, which is a uh, partner to this Be Fantastic program that we're on today and which runs funded art uh, and technology residencies and global workshops and um, a whole suite of like initiatives that enable artists to do emerging technology research uh, working alongside mission aligned uh, company thought works, you know, mission aligned collaborations. And, you know, the company has the reach of about 10,000 very highly technical employees. And so bringing artists closer into that community and seeing what we can do together. Um, and this is, you know, some of the work we've done is on climate, but we 
speak to a whole range of issues that relate to the impacts of emerging technology on society, which is, you know, a key theme um, of the moment, let's say. So I'm going to move through pretty quickly, you know, where that led after that is, okay, so one of the most powerful communities that I, <laughs> that I was a part of and had access to is climate action, is, uh, sorry, is, is the tech industry and technologists generally. I know a lot of tech people, I know a lot of art and tech people, and I know a lot of art people, but at the time, there was already a pretty active art-based community um, intervening on climate, but the tech community hadn't quite figured it out yet that everybody was operating in their own little subunits in different companies so um all of that trajectory that i just explained you know it came together and i worked with others in the industry to co-create this initiative called climateaction.tech which is um you know i i was there for the first few years as an organizer uh, but really now it has a life of its own it's really a, a juggernaut on its own direction and the cat community, as they call themselves, Climate Action Tech, nicely abbreviates to cat. So everything's cats, everybody's cats. Um, the cat community has around 5,000 members globally. It's very active. And um, part of the beauty of this actually is that you can sign up and you can, it's right at the core of everything that happens, all the projects is um, a very active Slack. And so anybody can sign up, you just fill out a form and go through a little mini screening and that's it. Um, and you know, it's a very active Slack and it has lots of subject interested people. And so the beauty of it is that you can sign up right now. You can find it one of the many channels with people who have the skills or interests that you're looking at and just go ahead and start posting there yourself. You don't need to wait for me to make the introduction. You can just, just jump right in. Um, and that could be on specific sets of technology expertise, um, but another thing that is very common is in climate action tech is for people to discuss their role in the world and what they're currently doing. So especially their activity within their workplaces and what their employers are doing. So there are people there from every global tech company you can think of, I'm sure. And uh, many of them are trying to influence those companies from the inside to, ad to adopt stronger policies as a company and also to speak out more publicly, again, to help shift narratives which is where a lot of the power and a lot of what the important work that has to be done with climate lies i think that like um developing technological tools is very very important because we're not there yet in terms of everything that we need in order to tackle the climate crisis but the bigger problem is that we don't have enough public will to use the tools we already have at enough of a scale and with enough of an investment to impact the crisis you know, we could have been doing this for decades in a much stronger way. So helping to generate that public will by intervening in narratives is really, I think, the key to unlocking the problem of the climate crisis. So, you know, this isn't, Climate Action Tech isn't really like a place for public or external antagonism in this company. It's like there are a lot of people um, who meet in other places to do that. And, uh and there's a lot of like impact that, that work has and uh we're very respectful of that and some of those people are members but the climate action tech community typically looks for ways to be effective internally and one of the ways to be effective internally is to have people who understand the crisis and who are activated make interventions and help those companies step um, in the right directions and you know draft statements that end up getting published um make policy uh, proposals that end up getting accepted you know so that's the kind of work that that goes on there um really highly technical stuff and they have some great like ask me anything channels where you can just go in with any random question and get some a whole bunch of interjection and responses um and of course i have an established network within these uh, communities so as a mentor on this program if if any of that is helpful and you want to make some of these connections or introductions, that's something that we can do too. Um, I'll stop sharing and um, just say, yeah, I'm happy to be part of this program and really looking forward to working with you. And if any of these ideas or suggestions make sense, uh, I'd be happy to help. I have to go in five minutes because I have a son and uh, I have to uh, help look after him. But like, um, I don't know if, if you wanted to switch to somebody else or if they wanted to do a question now or change the format slightly. 
And the, uh, yes, we decided that we'll do a quick Q&A before you have to leave so we can get all the questions into you. I think there's one that's just come in and it talks about your practice um, and how do you initiate your projects, uh, your process, and if you self-fund projects, or do you wait for a brief and then act on it? And this is by Pranshul. Yeah, never wait for a brief. <laughs> <laughs> never wait for a brief. Um, fun, so basically, um, I think it, I think that it was like a recognition of the potential that's all around us. Sometimes we just miss the forest for the trees in terms of like just being in this room. There's potential just saturating this call, um, and and especially with the power of uh, online communication, you know, like you, I, I've lost count of the number of people that I've contacted. I'm sure a lot of people on this panel and in this room have done this too. So this isn't new information for you, but I've lost count of the number of people that I've contacted just through their website right and then it's like hey uh, i'm doing this thing and people love being asked about themselves like love being asked their opinion and that draws people in and then it's like okay maybe if we work together okay so then what if we add to that so you know it's a snowball thing um and yeah the process so i described as far as, as far as like art practice is concerned and i i guess this like plays out in the other areas of what i do um sketching and again, this is another reason I think this would be fantastic. It does a great job is that like it starts you off with sketching and, you know, you run quickly through experiments and um, but then you don't stop there. You say, OK, so now uh, what, how do we take the, what, this pool of what we've generated and like think of what's the medium sized version of this and then jump to that prototype. And so that's how I tend to initiate something new. Super. The next question is from Manan, who's the Be Fantastic team, is how can tech art be used for research and policy making processes, especially in the urban context to address these multi-layered issues we face? And I think you showed a project that kind of has urban interventions. Sorry, we'll take this as the last question because I know you have to go. Um, so I think that uh, from, for, from I would like to answer a slightly different question because I, you know so i think that like the role that technology art can play is to help build momentum towards exist there are already lots of policy frameworks and the struggle is to how to get them accepted and how how to make them successful and to do that there's awareness raising there's idea intervention and um, building support for the idea of, of those policies being desirable being real and, and you know you're fighting like a huge disinformation architecture so having authentic interventions by artists especially and this is where the tech art comes in is like especially when those artists are using the tools they're critiquing and or using innovative tools that actually grab attention and or um doing original research using those tools because that brings audiences along that brings people along into your personal journey and that can help uh, build an image of a um, future i mean this is one of the things that everybody that the activists and the change makers and the policy makers really want is for us to think about how our into like how can we build futures people we can people can believe in and so you know critiquing and pulling apart what's there is important but then piecing it back together i mean that's powerful so that's i think it's not quite the answer to the question but i hope that's helpful um i do have to go i'm sorry i wish i i didn't know the session was going to extend past this but thank you for no, that's that's go. okay thank you so much i think that was a great answer and kind of looking at us uh, coming together and what we can do and thank you andy i i know you have to go so we will allow you to do so <laughs> thank you everybody Take care. Thank you. As uh, Andy leaves, we will, um, if we could have Mark Lee's presentation set up for the next round um, of uh, the presentation. I just quickly like to add, I actually had a little bit of an experience on, on community because I went to study farming up in Dehradun with this lady called Vandana Shiva, who's kind of a huge activist in the food space. And um, I actually was planning to leave behind my art career and and go on to be a farmer. And she was like, hey, we don't actually need more farmers. We need people like you to be able to 
elevate the voice of, of this kind of activism through art and through kind of um, the projects that you're able to do because you don't use language. You might write an activist paper, but how many people is it going to reach? Can you make it a kind of visual mode and share it through? So I thought that was really powerful and kind of set me back um, onto my practice. And I, I'm still growing as a farmer, but um, it also kind of puts into perspective what each one of us can do um, and, and how art is a really important tool, obviously visually as first because the access is much larger. But just wanted to share that. Um, Manan, yeah. over to you to set up um, for Mark Lee. Thank you for those insights, Trishla. It was really thoughtful. Thank uh, you, Manan. <laughs> While that's getting set up, please stay tuned for Mark Lee. He does have some really interesting work. I hope it works all fine right now. Um, very sharing? interactive, very thought provoking. As we yeah. start, if there's any glitches on your screen, if you can't see, if you can't hear, if you could just mention on the screen so we know that everything's going smoothly for everyone, that would be great. Yes, and also please put in your questions in the chat. We will reach out to Mark Lee and hopefully we can get him to answer your, some of your questions. Um, he is not here today, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to, to give this uh, uh, online presentation. Uh, I like to share three works. Uh, one is addressing biodiversity, the other one kind of also diversity, and uh, the third one it's, uh, can be accustomed to the topic of climate change. In general, I do uh, work. Manan, which the video are is frozen for most people. And uh, always for change. Me as well. I think there is a glitch in the. Let me, let me try. Um, sorry about this. One more try. Is everyone able to see this? We can see the screen, yeah. Okay. Okay, he seems to be moving. Now there's video, okay, so, but there wasn't. Audio. All right, so that, that's good, that's better. Let me share them. This should work. Oh, to give this a... Uh... Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to, to give this a... Uh... Uh, online presentation. Yeah, it seems to be okay. Uh, I like to share three works. Uh, one is addressing biodiversity, the other one kind of also diversity, and uh, the third one it uh, can be accustomed to the topic of climate change. In general, I do uh, works which are interactive and always change, and uh, that is. Uh, something which uh, yeah I follow since a long time because usually art is not changing art is kind of static so when you go into paintings or photography or video it's a, a art form which try to capture a moment and then it stays as it is and our life you know we are biological uh, uh, humans or all world around us is, is made of, of biology of of uh, yeah of microorganism and this always change every second everything is changing and so this is uh, yeah this is I also address this and this is how my my uh, project work they constantly change they never stay the same. Uh, very often I use uh, social media for the projects and the first one I like to uh, share with you is called used to be my home too and this work is uh, using three social networks it using uh, Google Earth uh, and it uses iNaturalist iNaturalist is a social network where people can share observations and the third uh, network I use, it's called Redlist. Redlist is a, is a, a very wide list to uh, which, they, uh, which they collect data about uh, spaces which are disappeared or in near or threatened. Uh, they they uh, do animals, plants and uh, fungus. 
And now back to the work. Uh, what it does, I show you. I show you this video and explain during showing the video how it works. Uh, it uses Google Earth, and Google Earth fly to the location where uh, people upload uh, observations to iNaturalist and flies always to more or less the latest uploaded uh, observations. For example, this uh, person uploaded this fungi at a specific location and the Google Earth flies to this position. And in the third step, I make a, a stop, uh, you see animals or fungi or plants which are extinct or nearly extinct at the same location. So now it says the United States of America used to be my home too. And so the work uh, continues endless. It's 24-7 uh, uh, online and uh, yeah, always takes uh, somehow the latest observation, flies to the position and searches from the lead list uh, similar uh, spaces. Uh, for example, this is a good uh, example because this person uploaded this bird uh, four minutes ago and you see birds which are these three birds are extinct. Uh, and you yeah you cannot read it here but they they are recently extinct animals. Yeah, and the work is, a, I mean, this is a video I, I show you uh, here, but this uh, yeah, uses uh, a computer. You have to install Google Earth and you can enter a network link and then you can use this at home. When I uh, exhibit the work, I like it to exhibit like this. Uh, it's in, a, in a portrait mode. It's kind of a, a small screen. I don't like to use a large screen. I like to have a, a smaller screen, maybe 30 or 40 sol. And I usually, usually just put it uh, uh, pointed to the wall, uh, not hanging on the wall. And yeah, this is uh, the installation view of this work. OK, uh, now I jump to the next work. The next work is a bit more complicated. It's called 10,000 Moving Cities, same but different. And there are four versions. It's the same subject for all these four versions, but technically they're very different. The first version, it shows uh, cubes uh, in, a, in an exhibition space and you can walk around the cubes and the cubes are projected with information the user can choose. The user can choose any city on a world map, and then you see on the cubes information about the city. Uh, searched on uh, about six different social networks like YouTube, Twitter, Flickr, uh, Instagram, Freesound, uh, yeah, and a couple of more. And the second version, uh, you it's a VR version. You wear a, a VR Google and you can uh, also choose a city and then you can virtually walk around this city in in three uh, in three dimension the uh, third version is an ar version and in this version uh, this runs on a mobile phone or on a tablet and you you see virtual building uh, appear in in the device and uh, the fourth the last version it's a mobile version uh, where you uh, also can navigate uh, endless through an endless city. And on the, you again, you see these kind of skyscrapers uh, having information from social media about the city you can choose. To uh, become more clear how this looks like, I will show you a video and for that I quickly stop sharing and I optimize my sharing for a video and now I show you this it's a two minute video and I hope you will hear the sound. Hi, by watching this video you will understand the work 10,000 moving cities same but different and its four versions. 
The first version exists of real cubes using a space approximately 20 by 20 by 5 meters. The second version is a digitalized archived VR version using a space 5 by 5 meters. The third is a mobile version and fourth an AR version which can be used anywhere. They are not bound to an exhibition space. All four versions of 10,000 moving cities are technologically very different but deal with the same topic. If you look back a few hundred years, houses were built mostly by local materials, by local people using local or self-made tools. Now, houses were built using materials from all continents by international architects and laborers using international tools. In a global perspective, this leads to a tremendous homogenization. Places are emerging that could be anywhere in the world without a real local identity. In this sense, 10,000 moving cities, same but different, explore how globalization creates places without a local identity, as described in Marc Auger's essay Nolieu or Nitalo Calvino's Invisible Cities. In 10,000 moving cities, all cities have the identical buildings. But the information on the building facades are always different. They are searched in real time on social networks about the chosen location. Not censored nor chosen by a certain community, rather produced by the public. User generated content. Including exhibition visitors maybe. In this way, each request also enables an active participation in social movements of our time at a specific self-chosen location. Okay. So I do uh, show. So that's about the uh, work 10,000 moving city, same but different. Uh, I like to mention the, the VR version and the, the two mobile version, also the mobile version, the AR version, they are done in collaboration uh, with the students from the Technical University uh, of Karlsruhe. Uh, there was a collaboration for oh, it was a long time. We developed a long time for these two projects, maybe all together three years. And uh, yeah, so they did a lot of the techno technological part. And for example, in the, the mobile version, it's um, special because you have an uh, endless space. So you stay, uh, you stay, uh, you stay in the city uh, endlessly. So just to show you shortly, uh, yeah, it's uh, actually quality is not that good, but uh, when you travel through the city, it's uh, endless. So you always stay in this kind of weird futuristic environment, and uh, you are you have no chance to escape. You always stay in the city, and uh, the the content you see here it's searched on uh, Twitter. In that case, only on Twitter. And you have a, a, a navigation. I think you see that later on, where you can uh, can choose the the city. And when you choose the city, you see only posts which are uploaded uh, in a in a radius of three kilometers from that uh, specific location. So, for example, she chose Berlin, and now you see only Twitter posts which are uploaded. Uh, from Berlin in an area of, of three kilometers. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and as the video said, this uh, the, the, the subject is on all works the same. It subjects it addresses the, the uh, how our life becomes more and more uh, homogeneous. I mean, on the first place, we do not we do not feel that. But if we go to a bird view perspective, if we look a few hundred years back, uh, that becomes very clear. Uh, for example, if we, if we address the architecture, 
Uh, now the architecture, the, the, the cosmopolitan cities, they look very similar. They have these glass buildings. The architecture, they, they work internationally. The, the materials which are used for the building, they, they also come from, from, a, from many different countries. Uh, the laborers who build the buildings come from different countries. The software where the, the buildings are designed comes uh, are using all more or less the same kind of softwares. And when you yeah, watch back a few hundred years ago, I mean, things were built with local material, with local tools, with local uh, laborers, and each building was unique. And uh, yeah, in, and now it, it's, a, it's a completely different situation. And of course, this not stays in architecture, it stays also in languages, languages disappear. Uh, a good example are airports. For example, when you go to airports, you almost cannot know where you are. You can buy the same products in airports, you can drink the same wine, you uh, see the same shopping chains. Okay. Nice project I like to share. And the last project, now you see, uh, here you see a YouTube video, which are muted for you. And in the background, you see a Twitter feed, uh, which is uploaded two minutes ago. And this is the, the title of this Twitter feed. And this video is playing uh, information it's very randomly, the latest content. Uh, it was uploaded two minutes ago. And below here, you see the statistics. For example, uh, climate has 900 uh, and biodiversity 80, uh, 58 posts. So you see which it's used. And now you see uh, yeah, a private video about climate. Somebody is making a video about the book. So it's very, very random. And on top of it, you see uh, posts on uh, Twitter oh, about the subject either climate or biodiversity. And this broadcast, it's 24-7 uh, it's online. Uh, you, could, uh, you can use it at home. It's... Uh, it's, uh, it's called also NetArt, it's, it's working on the internet. So you, uh, yeah, you just to URL and you can uh, use any keywords and then you can make this kind of uh, news broadcasts. Uh, maybe I like to add it, it looks like a bit like a kind of CNN style. Uh, you see so much information at the same time, usually you cannot read all, and that's also kind of uh, how the how CNN is doing it. They, they have multiple information uh, at once, so that sometimes you have the feeling they they more want to entertain, they they want to uh, actually explain. Uh, so they 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 try to, to keep the the viewers as long as possible uh, viewing the broadcast. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for joining and uh, listen to it. Thank you. So thank you to Mark Lee. Unfortunately, he was not able to join us for the session today, but I see some questions coming in for him. Please do uh, add them in the chat and we will reach out to him and, and get answers to these. Um, so I think that calls it an end to our session. I will hand over to Kamya. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. So Trishan, I think we have about 10 minutes left in okay. case the room wants to open up for some more discussions. Sure, if, if anyone in the group would like to Ask, I think also it's a great time to, to discuss amongst the group if you'd like, uh, if anyone has any thoughts to share, if anyone wants to share new reactions. Jean and Meredith, if you guys are still in the room, maybe the group could even ask you questions. I'm also happy to chat with anyone if anyone would like to.
I believe there was one question that was unanswered from Gautam for Jean. If Gautam would like to ask that question now. Uh, Karthika, let's just check if Jean is still around. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's there. Okay, there he is. Okay. So okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, this is a long time ago, but uh, broadly, it is about uh, collaborative uh, work. You said that you were developing tools that made that collaboration easier or uh, more democratic. I'm not sure what you said, but is that leading to more kind of collaborative work that, uh, you know, is uh, made by several artists? Uh, uh, is it leading to a situation where, you know, no single artist is being credited for a work, but is it leading to more such work is what I mean. I mean, people have been doing that for a long time and maybe now too, uh, there'll be many models that people follow, but uh, is, there, is, is there a trend towards that was my question. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think so. Um, so with, I work a lot with machine learning and one of the things that I've come to kind of think about this workflow is that um, it's very hard for me to sort of take all the credit of the works that I make because I'm sitting on a like a mountain of uh, not and I don't, I'm not even talking about like the scientific work that goes into making this technology but also um, I'm using code that by now has had you know if you dig all the way down it's been written by hundreds or thousands you know tens of thousands of people and then using data sets that are trained on collectively millions of peoples of data and so um, I'm not saying necessarily that everyone contributed equally to that work, but, you know, there's definitely, you know, millions of people to, so that had some kind of influence on at least the pixel that comes out. And so I've been interested in ways of acknowledging and even, and even compensating, um, you know, people in, in, a, in a, you know, sort of a, in a way that I think respects that history. Um, there's a trend in AI art where, um, most, I would say most AI artists now don't actually, um, don't, uh, don't actually uh, credit the software developers that made the works that they use. They used to be very common to, to do that. It was like kind of a more academic standard. Um, now it's sort of, now because there's so much money in it and everything and co competition, it, it, you just see that all of that has kind of like withered away. Um, and um, and which is tragic because, you know, I think, you know, the more that you can acknowledge and, co and, and compensate, you know, people for their roles, the, the, the more forward that technology will go because, you know, otherwise people don't really have a lifeline to, to help. Um, one of the things, this is more of a, a long-term goal for Abraham. It's not probably something I can do in the next year, uh, but I'd like to figure out ways of, of actually, because I'm, I'm trying to make it a crypto-based network. And so a lot of this stuff can be programmed directly into, into the, um, you know, into the application. Um, but I'd be interested in kind of creating um, systems that, that collect and, you know, may, maybe even offer micropayments for data, for example, um, to the extent that that's possible. I think there are projects that are making that a little bit, you know, more possible. And, um, and, and also to um, incentivize all of the, to incentivize a group of people to, um, to influence that artwork. And it, it might be in a very simple way, like a game-like way almost, you know, curating basically text inputs. Um, but, um, but you can, um, but you know, to the extent that people are curating in such a way that is successful, like if they're, cur if they're good curators, um, they, they too should get paid in some sense. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of interested in these I'm, I'm, I've been, I've read a lot about different, you know, suggestions, ideas in this space, um, and hoping to implement, um, in the near future. It's all very fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gautam. I think you've touched upon a very interesting question, which I can go into uh, a, a depth of things, which is the politics of, of crediting. And I think as we work with communities also on ground, a lot of these become, blurred lines of, of who gets the credit and uh, is the one who puts it out there or the one who puts in the work. And I think these are all great questions to think about. Um, there are also some other questions that are coming in, uh, Jean and Meredith. So uh, let's, let's take those if you have a few minutes. Okay, so um, I think this one's for Jean as uh, what are the basic parameters for creating such an app? I think it talks about the 
the collaborative app that you're looking at or interactions? How is the data collected? Um, what, is, what is the process of doing that? Right now in, in, uh, in Abraham, there is no data collection just now, um, but in the future, I'd like for it to do so. Right now, the way that data collection works in general on the internet is um, is that you know you have platforms like Google and Facebook and you know whoever else Quora, um, and they download uh, they get lots of data from you know from their users and they singularly own that data and then they train machine learning models on that data and then they they monetize that those uh, models and so um, this um, and and of course and to some degree you can understand why it, it, it like from a technological perspective, it, it makes sense to centralize data for machine learning because it's not really, it's not easy to do. It requires a lot of computation. So if the if you have data on, on a million computers instead of on one computer, it's really hard to actually train the machine learning model. Um, but there are actually, um, uh, you know, research developments and um, interesting initiatives to to actually make it possible to train um, data in a more, it, it, so one, one thing, for example, is called federated learning, where um, this is machine learning, which is trained remo on remote data. Um, so the data doesn't get centralized, it just stays on users' machines, for example. And the way that works is that you have a machine learning model and you, and you basically send it to each person, they train it a little bit in their data, send it to the next person, train it a little bit in their data, send it to the next person and so on. And it's slow and inefficient, but but it does um, it does achieve a few interest. It does achieve some really great things, like you know it it does um, uh, se secure people's privacy for at, at a start, um, and then also you know it, it creates the a mechanism that might actually you know turn over ownership to people's data to themselves. Um, so I'd like to see you know like the users make their their data. You know, so, so everyone probably by now has heard of NFTs, right? And what they associate with NFTs is, you know, $1 million artworks or whatever, things like that. Um, but NFTs, um, once they're cheap anyway, it uh, could be assigned to literally every piece of content that you put on the internet. Um, and then, you know, it, and, it, and it secures your rights to the content that you make. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so... Um, so, you know, I'd like to see that technology develop in that direction. Yes, that's fantastic. Jean, since you touched upon NFTs, I'd just like to kind of add in, because uh, as, as we're talking about a kind of data, a data relay here of how one adds on to the other, when it comes to NFTs, even if you make the slightest modifications, bless you, um, if you make the slightest modifications, you can essentially register it as a new kind of NFT. So how would that kind of impact uh, originality in a sense? Or is there uh, anything of this Can story? you clarify, what do you mean? Um, if you change what? So in an NFT, well, based on what I've heard is that if you make any edits, even though the work might not belong to you, you can claim it as a new work. Oh, oh, like if you copy somebody's uh, artwork and make a new NFT and, on top of it? Yeah, if you make like the slightest edit and make a new NFT on top of it. Oh, yeah, so then yeah, how, yeah. how do we deal with originality if it's so easy yeah. to kind of just edit a small part of it to, yeah. to call it your own? I mean, uh, probably kind of the way that we deal with it with other things too. So like if I made a copy of the Mona Lisa and hung it up in my bedroom wall and I was like, hey, this is the Mona Lisa. Someone pay me $5 million for it. No one would really do it, right? So uh, now that's hard. It's harder on the internet because it, it, it's, you know, most things are not as famous as the Mona Lisa. So so it's it, it definitely is a problem in, in a lot of the, you know, art marketplaces that there's like what's called copy minting. So you just copy someone else's artwork and, you know, try to make money off of it. That's a big problem. Um, but there's, you know, there's there's definitely ways. Um, yeah, yeah there, there was a comment there by, by Lisa. So I, IP laws also do still apply. So there's intellectual property laws that could possibly protect you. And, um, and also like legitimacy. There's kind of this social legitimacy that, you know, platforms that are subject to a lot of this kind of um, stuff, they, they, you know, they're, they're just not going to grow to be very valuable because, you know, people really care about that. And, and so, um, so, so yeah, like, um, but yeah, it, it is definitely a problem. Yeah. Super. I think um, I would have liked to take some, but I think that brings us to the end of time. So I, I will, I will let this pass. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone. Uh, be here. Uh, over to you, Kamya.
And thank you, Trishla, for navigating us through all of this fun stuff. So Meredith Jean, we look forward to interacting with you a lot, lot more. Trishla, we look forward to staying in touch and seeing where Tifa and the Fantastic can intersect. And for the rest of us who are in the fellowship, see you tomorrow. Bye, Jean. Bye, Thank Meredith. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, Chitra, are you still here?